Dear friends, I'll be talking about endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy is used for treatment of hydrocephalus in which the opening is made in the third ventricle floor using endoscope. This allows CSF to flow directly from basal cistern bypassing the obstruction. This is treatment of choice in obstructive hydrocephalus. Also can be used in selected communicating hydrocephalus with anterior and inferior bulging of third ventricle floor. This is not a good option in acute stage of post-hemorrhagic and post-infective hydrocephalus. It is technically demanding and has poor success rate. But there is good result in chronic phase of post-hemorrhagic and post-infective hydrocephalus. The best indications are congenital or acquired aqueductal stenosis also can be used when the lesion is in the post third ventricle and in the post fossa. It can also be used in some of the congenital anomalies is associated with hydrocephalus. The ETV associated with congenital malformation may be difficult because of associated congenital anomaly such as large interthalamic adhesions and abnormal third ventricle anatomy. ETV is also indicated in post-infective such as TBM neurocystis sarcosis, secondary ETV or infective pathology or the post cerebellar infarct, interventricular hemorrhage, etc. It can be used in association with the biopsy. In such cases, two bar hole may be required if the Foreman Monroe is small. One bar hole may be used when the Foreman Monroe is large and you have rotated the working channel. One bar hole may also be used when there is a flexible scope. If the instruments do not reach at two desired sites like in ETV and biopsy as shown here, the trajectory for biopsy is shown here and uh, trajectory for ETV is here. So these are two different places as shown in this diagram and also in this for biopsy and for ETV. So in such situation, what are the options? One should avoid linear movement when you are in the third ventricle. Uh, but if it is required, then uh, linear movement up to 5 millimeter can be tolerated by the fornix. Second option is that uh, one can rotate uh, the endoscope working channel for ATV, you keep um, working channel anteriorly and for biopsy, you rotate it posteriorly. The other option is that you station the scope at Formano Monroe and introduce fine instrument under endoscopic vision. Although difficult but it is useful in multilocalated hydrocephalus um, which is seen in infection and IVH in which you can break the septa and make it a unilocular cavity. ETV can be performed rarely, but it is technically demanding. But at least you can place VP shunt in a unilocular hydrocephalus. It can also be used in slit ventricle syndrome, but it is difficult to hit the ventricle. In such cases, a small flexible scope can be used along with the shunt tube. You can also hit the ventricle under stereotactic or USG guidance. One can use a small scope. The distal end of the shunt can also be extruderized and blocked and you allow the ventricle to get dilated and then you do ETV. In hydrocephalus associated with IVH, one can do ETV with or without removal of the clot. The other options are EVD and thrombolysis. ETV also can be performed in NPH when third ventricle floor or anterior wall is bulging. The other options are shunt but there are contraindications and there is a significantly distorted uh, ventricular anatomy when there is abnormally narrow prepontine space because of the tumor or any other lesion in premature infant and in uh, post-hemorrhagic and post-infective hydrocephalus. There are difficult to treat cases of ETV, especially in the beginning of learning curve, one should avoid uh, doing these cases. It is difficult when there is a basal exudate in acute phase of infection as shown here in this image. One should avoid the ETV in such case. If there is no other option then it can be done at alternate sites such as lamina terminalis can be perforated or quadrigeminal system can also be perforated. It is difficult in high riding vertebral artery as shown here. It is difficult when brainstem and basilar arteries are pushed anterior against the dorsum celli as shown here. One can find difficulty when there are large interthalamic adhesion as shown here 
or there is an inflammation of the third ventricle floor or the floor is thick as shown here. One can find difficulty in dark ventricle syndrome when a scope is introduced in very large lateral ventricle. This is because of the small focal length of the endoscope. The structures in the floor of third ventricle are not visualized. The solution is that you move endoscope slowly deeper in the lateral ventricle. The structures in the lateral ventricle floor start visualizing when it comes in the focal length of the endoscope. One should select good cases for ATV. There should be sufficiently large lateral ventricle and Furman Monroe and third ventricle width. Absent intrathalamic adhesions, thin third ventricle floor, good prepontine space, sufficient space between basilar artery and dorsum cellae, absence of high riding vertebral artery, absence of basal exudate, no abnormal vessel below third ventricle floor, sufficient distance between midline and the post communicating artery, knowledge of presence or absence of lilicased membrane or any other membrane in prepontine cistern. The distal CSF pathway beyond basal cisterns should be good. There should be good CSF absorption which can be assessed by good cisternal status, early stroke volume in CNA phase contrast MR, low lumbar outflow resistance and low ventricular outflow resistance. But high outflow resistance does not always mean that the CSF absorption is poor and there is a blocked subarachnoid space. High resistance may also be because of the dilated ventricle which are pressing cisterns and causing high resistance. In such cases, the prognosis may be good. In surgical technique, patient is supine. Some author use semi-sitting position also. Head is flexed so that the bar hole is at the highest point. Mark midline and coronal suture as shown here. This is the coronal suture. This is the midline. Bar hole is marked and the direction towards the external auditory matrix is also marked on the skin. The most important point in ETV surgery is site of bar hole and the trajectory, especially when Furman Monroe is comparatively small. It depends on the individual parameters and ventricular dilatation. Usually it is near the coronal suture. One should reach at the Furman Monroe. This can be done by using navigation or mark Furman Monroe using CT or MRI. One can also use anatomical landmark. We know that the Furman Monroe is about 5 to 6 cm depth at a line joining coronal suture to external auditory matrix. The penetration for ventricular puncture should be medially and towards the external auditory matrix to allow endoscope to reach at the Forman Monroe. Bar hole is usually on the right side. Enter in less dilated ventricle when there is asymmetrical hydrocephalus because of two reasons. One is that it is easy to perforate septum. Second, more dilated the ventricle can have blocked Forman Monroe. Insertion in the lateral ventricle should not go beyond 5 to 6 cm depth. Avoid over drainage of CSF and prevent entry of air in the ventricle and subdural space. Too much loss of CSF may cause subdural hematoma. Proper bar hole site on sagittal plane is decided by line extending from interpeduncular cistern to Forman Monroe to the skull as shown here. Prepontine cistern to Forman Monroe and the skull. One can enter at a wrong place in the lateral ventricle as shown in this picture. This is the correct entry in the lateral ventricle and third ventricle but you can enter more posteriorly or more anteriorly and then you can injure the cortex if you move up to reach at the Forman Monroe. You can reach at wrong place in the third ventricle also as shown here. This is the correct trajectory in the third ventricle but uh, the trajectory can be wrong anterior or posterior. In that case if you try to move your scope you can injure the fornix and can also injure the vessel and cause bleeding. There should be proper site of bar hole on coronal plane also as shown here. This is the correct uh, site of bar hole and trajectory as shown in green line. It should be as medial as possible. It should be a line extending from midline in the third ventricle to Furman Monroe onto the skull. The distance uh, from the midline should be calculated. Usually it is as medial as possible 2 to 3 centimeter lateral to the midline. Wrong site of bar hole or trajectory predisposes to the fornix injury. The green line uh, showing uh, site of the bar hole trajectory from the ipsilateral fornix to the midline of third ventricle. So this is the correct site of bar hole and trajectory.
trajectory but if you take a wrong trajectory and go on to the opposite side of the fornix and then try to come to the midline you can injure both the fornix in surgical technique various endoscopic systems are used we commonly use lota system lota system endoscope has working channel irrigation and suction channel and the scope with light source this is the working channel irrigation and suction and this is the endoscope with light source the trocar which is placed inside the seat can have hole or it can be without hole as shown here the one which has the hole is preferred because this tells uh, the entry into the lateral ventricle one should use brain cannula to puncture the ventricle there should be no direct puncture by the seat feel away seat or other seat should be slightly larger than the endoscope to allow irrigation fluid to come out this is the peel away seat and this is the seat which is used in gap system one can use endoscope holder or can use free hand technique to hold the endoscope left hand of the surgeon is holding the scope and the right hand is used for the instrument manipulation the telescope knob should be loose so that you can use it without losing any time telescope holder arm should be supported by the assistant and using this technique time wastage in locking and unlocking can be avoided this is a short procedure so why a telescope holder at all should be used so the explanation is if there is any bleeding or other complications surgeon can station endoscope in the lateral ventricle and it gives rest to the hand of the surgeon hand can be supported on the working channel when the instruments are used as shown in this diagram lactate solution should be used for irrigation because the average ph and osmolality of ringer is closer to the blood as shown in this table the fluid should be under normal body temperature one should use normal gravity pressure as against any pressure technique to avoid any barotrauma to the brain if septum pellucidum perforation is needed take the lateral entry as shown in the diagram a is showing the entry for etv but if you make uh, septum pellucidum perforation you should come uh, more laterally perpendicular to the septum to perforate it when etv and septum perforation is needed through the same bar hole then it can be done in such cases use one limb opening forceps as shown here only one limb is opening so place this opening limb near the septum pellucidum and open it as against the forceps in which both the limbs are opening foramen of monroe can be identified by the confluence of thalmostat vein septal vein and choroid plexus as shown in this diagram you have choroid plexus septal vein although thalmostat vein is not seen in this fenestration in third ventricle floor should be in between the mammillary bodies and in fundibular races at most transparent place in the midline and it should always be anterior to the basilar artery or its branches in this diagram you can see this is in fundibular races and these are mammillary bodies in between in fundibular races and mammillary bodies at a most translucent place the perforation should be done this is the basilar artery so the perforation should be anterior to this cork screw movement can be used for fenestration never perforate posterior to the basilar artery or its branch because there can be perforators ventriculostomy forceps can be used for enlargement of the stroma it should have outer serrations for enlargement and engagement of the stoma location of basilar artery should be identified to avoid injury and bleeding vascular doppler or navigation can be used when there is a thick floor the end stage of the procedure is bare basilar artery there may be second membrane which should be perforated one can perforate on the dorsum sali when there is a less space between basilar artery and dorsum sali and when floor is thick as shown in this diagram with the forceps the membrane on the dorsum sali is perforated perforation behind the dorsum sali by blunt forceps can cause significant inferior displacement leading to bleeding and injury to third cranial nerve and brain stem water jet dissection can be used when there is a thick and inflamed floor such as in tbm hydrocephalus these are the steps of water jet dissection we have improvised the technique of water jet dissection using a syringe and catheter if the jaws of the ventriculostomy forceps is not seen during the third ventricle perforation this could be because of these three reasons it could be because of high 
हाई मैग्निफिकेशन यूजिंग जूम बटन और हाई मैग्निफिकेशन बिकॉज ऑफ द एंडोस्कोप इज टू क्लोज टू सर्जिकल टारगेट और स्कोप और बोथ जॉज ऑफ द फोरसेप्स आर इन स्ट्रेट लाइन एज शोन हेयर स्टोम परफोरेशन शुड बी फाइव मिलीमीटर और मोर हाउ टू मेक लार्ज ओपनिंग देर आर टू वेज वन ओपनिंग इज मेड एंड इट इज एन लार्ज विद फोरसेप और फोगाटी द सेकेंड मैथड इज टू ऑफ मिड लाइन ओपनिंग आर मेड एंड एन लार्ज एज शोन दिस डायग्राम शोज इन फंडिबुलर रिसेस एंड टू मेमुलरी बॉडीज टू ओपनिंग आर मेड जस्ट ऑफ मिड लाइन बोथ दीज ओपनिंग आर एन लार्ज एंड कनेक्टेड इन टू वन एंड लार्ज ओपनिंग इज मेड मेमरेन ऑफ लिलिकिस्ट इफ प्रेजेंट शुड बी ओपन अंडर डायरेक्ट एंडोस्कोपिक विजुअलाइजेशन एज शोन हेयर वन शुड नो द पार्ट ऑफ लिलिकिस्ट मेमरेन इट हैज सेलर सेगमेंट डायन कैफलिक एंड मेजर कैफलिक सेगमेंट इफ द परफोरेशन इज मेड पोस्टली देन वन कैन कम अक्रॉस टू मेमरेन डायन कैफलिक एंड मेजर कैफलिक सेगमेंट बट इफ यू मेक परफोरेशन लिटल एंटीरली यू विल कम अक्रॉस ओनली वन सेगमेंट देर मे बी वेरियस कॉज of third cranial now injury in etv pushing thick floor can injure third cranial now because of stretching thick membrane under third ventricle floor can be attached to the now now can be injured if when you make off midline perforation if there is a thin floor use blunt perforation to avoid vascular injury if there is a thick floor one can initially use short duration of low bipolar current to permit blunt perforation one should avoid high thermal and And electric energy authors have also described laser assisted third ventriculostomy inflate fogarty or open ventriculostomy forcep at the stoma don't open below the stoma and pull towards the third ventricle if it is below the third ventricle floor partially deflate the catheter or close the forcep withdraw it towards the third ventricle and inflate it again if there is any doubt about the functioning of etv during surgery intraoperative ventricle close tomography can provide information about the stoma patency and cisternal status radio opaque contrast is injected into the third ventricle by the catheter 6 cc can be used in adult and 3 cc in children it is classified as good when there is a rapid wash out of contrast in less than 1 minute time in fair there is a slow flow of dye the transit period is between 1 to 3 minutes and it is known as poor if the dye persists for more than 3 minutes etv usually fails if there is a poor flow of the dye and in such cases one should make decision paraoperatively to do a shunt procedure so to summarize an intraoperative decision when you are doing a etv the results are likely to be good if there is a favorable anatomy if there are good stromal pulsations good cistern and there is a good flow and there is folding in sign which is seen only in few percent is a patient where there is folding of the posterior third ventricle wall the other group can be doubtful cases when the stoma pulsations are not so good there is a slow flow of dye that means the dye stays between 1 to 3 minutes the cisterns are scarred so in such cases you can use omir reservoir along with the etv the third group is poor risk in which intraoperative decision for shunt placement should be done when there is a technical diff- difficulty when it is difficult to perform etv because of the thick red inflamed floor of third ventricle or abnormal floor of third ventricle when anatomy is not visualized very well when there is a bad cistern and when there is a poor flow post operative care in etv is also equally important failure to improve after etv could be because of blocked stoma complex hydrocephalus cerebral ischemia and poor neurological status before surgery so in such cases one should see whether there is evidence of raised icp or not if there is evidence of raised icp it could be because of the block stoma in which case re etv should be done or it could be because of the complex hydrocephalus which could be of two variety there could be temporary defect in csf uh, dynamics in which repeated lp can be done and the patient improves the other group has a permanent defect in the csf uh, circulation or absorption in which case lp shunt or vp shunt should be done if the patient is not improving and there is no evidence of raised icp then it could be because of the ischemia or poor neurological status before surgery so some of these patient they improve very slowly repeat
repeated LP uh, after ETV is helpful. Some of these patients who have temporary defect in CSF absorption or circulation can improve when you do 3 to 5 LPs during post-operative period. ETV failure usually occurs early. It is usually within 3 months. Regular clinical and radiological assessment must be performed especially in the first year. Clinical follow-up is better than radiological follow-up. The routine radiological follow-up can increase the chances of asymptomatic failure cases. Measurement of ICP in immediate post-op period can be done in high-risk patients who continue to have clinical features of raised ICP or fail to show clinical improvement. Diagnosis of patent stoma or blocked stoma post-operatively can be a problem. Conventional MRI can be used which can give rise to indirect judgment of stoma patency but it has low sensitivity. There may be resolution of periventricular edema, widening of subarachnoid space, decrease in third ventricle size and height and the angle. This is more sensitive than the lateral ventricle changes. The ventricle size can decrease very slowly over few months. Reduction in size is more prominent in acute phase and in the third ventricle width as compared to lateral ventricle. Third ventricle height and infundibulo chiasm angle reduction is more useful compared to other parameters. Low wide sign also can be used for detection of stoma patency. It can be described in T1 and T2 weighted at areas of narrowing but this finding is not consistent. The limitations are very weak or even absent flow wide can be seen if the stoma is very narrow. Cinephase contrast MRI is more sensitive and can be used even if there is no flow wide. It provides flow quantification. Stroke volume can be detected. It can determine the stoma patency. Minor flow across the stoma suggests early sign of closure. CT or MR ventriculography is effective in assessing subarachnoid space and stoma patency after ETV. This is one such case of blocked stoma. The dye is only seen in the ventricle and not in the subarachnoid space or in the cistern. This is CT cisternography. The complex hydrocephalus also can be detected. This patient had the patent stoma after ETV but patient continued to have raised ICP. CT ventriculography shows dilated the lateral third ventricle with good amount of dye in the basal cistern and subarachnoid space even at the level of atlas as shown in this diagram. So that means the stoma is patent but the patient continue to have raised ICP. So it is a complex hydrocephalus. There is a defect in the absorption also. ETV and telemetric intracranial pressure monitoring also has been described. Short comments about management of TBM hydrocephalus in our setup. There can be three types of hydrocephalus. There can be communicating hydrocephalus, obstructive hydrocephalus in acute phase or obstructive hydrocephalus in chronic phase. If it is communicating hydrocephalus, we do LP shunt. If it is obstructive hydrocephalus in chronic phase, we do ETV. If it is obstructive hydrocephalus in acute phase, we do VP shunt because ETV is demanding and the success rate is poor. If there is a patent aqueduct and cisternal scarring, then chances of ETV failure is more. The overall complication in ETV ranges between 2 to 15 percent, but the permanent complications are only few. There can be fever, bleeding, hemiparesis, gaze palsy, persistent subdural collection, memory disorders, altered sensorium, diabetes, insipidus, weight gain and precocious puberty. A short comment about secondary ETV. Secondary ETV is when there is a redo ETV after the failed ETV or ETV done after shunt failure. The result of secondary ETV after post-traumatic post-meningitis, cherry malformation, neural tube defect has significantly higher success rate than primary ETV. Now there is a question whether one should remove shunt which is in place. Remove the shunt if it comes out very easily. Ligation of shunt tube should be done if it is difficult to remove. This is a short video. CT scan showing triventriculomegaly. MRI is showing good prepontine space. Well dilated uh, lateral ventricle for Monroe. These are marking of the coronal sutures and midline and the bar hole marking. 
Barhul made hemostasis achieved Dura opened and retracted Pile vessel coagulated and cut. These are some of the instruments. Scope, bipolar forceps. Front closed me forceps. Scissors. Irrigation catheter. Pogarty catheter. This is a telescope holder. Knob should be placed in such a way that um, it can be moved freely. The sheath is introduced after ventricular cannula. Endoscope is introduced. One can see that the both um, choroid plexus are seen. That means uh, the septum pellucidum has been perforated. This happens in children for long-standing hydrocephalus. You see the choroid plexus, you see thalmostrat vein, you see the septal vein. So this is how you can identify the ipsilateral foramen of Monroe. Also identify both mammillary bodies. So these are both mammillary bodies and infantibular races in front. This is basal artery tip, so translucent place in between uh, the infantibular races and mammillary body. The perforation in the floor of third ventricle is made initially using very low current because this was a thick floor. Uh, this was dilated using the same bipolar forceps. But this was possible because the Foreman Monroe was large. If there is a small Foreman Monroe, then these little movements should be avoided. This is a ventriculostomy forceps, which is dilating the stoma. Bare basilar artery is seen. So there is no other membrane in between the ventricle and the basilar artery. So that is end stage of surgery for the dilatation of stoma done with the Fogarty catheter. It is inflated at the stoma level, not that you inflate it below the stoma and then you pull it back. So this is after surgery. No damage and uh, there is no bleeding from the cortical margin. Choroid plexus coagulation can also be combined with the ETV in infantile hydrocephalus with the spinal malformation such as myelomeningocele and spina bifida. Infants with the infective uh, and post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, infants with the low cortical, mental, and large ventriculomegaly, and in Dandivacker malformation. There can be alternate site of third ventriculostomy. When third ventricle floor is not suitable. Subfrontal approach for uh, lamina terminalis uh, fenestration can be done. This was done by Spino in Cadaver and by Dr. Sanjeev Kumar in live patients. Transventricular lamina terminalis fenestration can be performed. Quadrigeminal cistern also can be opened. One can communicate temporal horn with supracellular or perimagencephalic cistern. This is uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar representing of how to open the lamina terminalis using subfrontal approach. You comments about ETV success and yes, success of ETV in children was poor compared to adult in some series. Pulkarni et al. found that there is a relative higher risk of initial ETV failure in infant of less than 6 months compared to adults. Relative risk become progressively lower after 3 months. We and the other author found that uh, age has no bearing on success 
success rate of ETV. This is the ETV success score. If the success score is 60 to 70, then it is likely to give good results. If it is less, the results could be poor. And the success depends upon the age. Less the age, there are high chances of uh, failure and etiology, post-infective and congenital anomalies, myelomeningocele, intraventricular hemorrhage, have poor prognosis the patient who is already on shunt such patient have collapsed subarachnoid space you can watch for details our various endoscopic video on youtube you can also refer to our article published in various journals on etv thank you very much thanks